Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. See the club's videos on YouTube and catch up with the club on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Cheryl Davis, Executive Director of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission and your moderator for today's program. The San Francisco Human Rights Commission is a city agency mandated to address causes of and problems resulting from prejudice, intolerance, bigotry, and discrimination in San Francisco, and has been pleased to provide assistance with this program tonight. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guest, Dr. Cornell West, professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University, Professor Emeritus at Princeton University and author of the book, Race Matters. Dr. Cornell West says his passion is to keep alive the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A legacy of telling the truth and bearing witness to love and justice. In addition to his post at Harvard and Princeton, West has taught at the Union Theological Seminary, Yale, and the University of Paris. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his master's and doctorate in philosophy at Princeton. In a polarized country with issues of voter disenfranchisement, police shootings of unarmed African Americans, and discussions of reparations at the forefront, our guests will explore the possibilities for improved life outcomes and opportunities for black people, particularly in cities such as San Francisco, as the wealth gap continues to swell. In commemoration of the 55th anniversary of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, which was created in response to anti-black racism in businesses, mm. government services, and community investments, we're going to have a conversation with one of the nation's most prominent and provocative civil rights champions about America's and San Francisco's present and future racial equity. Please welcome Dr. Cornell West. So, first and foremost, I have to thank Dr. West for once again um, accepting the call to come to San Francisco and have a conversation. Um, it has been an interesting journey, 55 years. The HRC was created to address, initially at the heart of it, anti-blackness. And when we think about your call or your, your call from within to kind of answer and push forward this idea of love and justice, um, and we think about race relations today, I have one of my favorite books, mm -hmm. Dr. King's book, Strength to Love. And when we think about the call to address it, right, this race relations piece in these conversations, in this book, one of the lines that he has is that we have to have the honesty to confront shattered dreams. And I think about the work that you've been doing and look at where we are today versus where we were 55 years ago, right? What does that honest conversation look like for you? Mm -hmm. Well, first, I want to just thank you for the work that you do. I want to salute your visionary leadership. Let's give it up for our dear sister. <laughs> well, David. Absolutely. And I also want to salute your sister. I know your sister's here somewhere, wherever she is. She sang last year. And you see, I come out of a tradition in which song is not ornamental and decorative. Mm, that's it's right. constitutive and integral to who I am. And if I can just sing a song tonight mm -mm. Uh -oh. in such a way that it unsettles you, then it would be a salute to, to your sister and the others, the Aretha Franklins and these. Sly Stones and others who constitute so much of that tradition. You know, it's 52 years ago that the great John Coltrane just died a few days ago. And that's part of the legacy as well. I think anytime we talk about politics, we really need to talk about the artists. Because the fundamental question when it comes to black people wrestling with the vicious legacy of white supremacy in this empire is what does it mean to be human? Mm. What kind of courage, what kind of vision, what costs are we willing really to bear? What kind of risks are we really willing to take? And the fact that here we are here, now this is the Commonwealth Club, 1903 he goes back, you know what I mean? Edward F. Adams, the first presentation he gave, he said, we want to find the truth and set it loose in the world. 1903, that's vanilla brother, way up power elite. 
with president of San Francisco State, president of Berkeley, president of banks and so forth. And then in the space of Harry Bridges. What a fascinating class, Bridge, born in Australia, fundamentally socialized, radicalized by the critique not just of capitalism, but of white supremacy as well. So the international longshoreman will become not just a site institutionally that will exemplify various kinds of struggles for justice, but would be open to brothers like Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. and Ella Baker mm. and mm. Fannie Lou Hamer mm. and Stokely Carmichael. Mm. Those are just not names in a pantheon. Those are human beings who decided in their own imperfection to try to be forces for good. I'm looking at Brother Willie Brown straight out of Texas and San Francisco, 85 years young, still on fire. Give it up for this brother right here. <laughs> still on fire. We go back to my native Sacramento, Speaker of the House, and I've always been an outsider. He's an insider. That's very important. We need a dialectical interplay between the ones on the outside who are willing to just bring all kind of wildness <laughs> in the critique, and then the ends on the inside to give them some space so they can kind of tilt the power mm -hmm. in such a way that those slash stone call everyday people have a dignity and a decency. Mm -hmm. And so here we are in 2019. 19. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Brother David Kim will tell you. My, <laughs> my colleague at Harvard and Brown and Connecticut College. We're in one of the grimmest moments in the history of this empire. We've got to be very honest about that. Mm. Mm. It's unclear the whether the fragile experiment in democracy can survive. Mm. You see. Mm. What I mean by that is not just rule of law, but democratic sensibilities mm. and sentiments being cultivated by the citizenry. Mm. And more and more the message is Survival of the slickest mm, mm. and the strongest, mm. which is a diametrically opposed notion of the tradition that produced me, which is one of you will be hated, respond with the deepest forms of love. You will be traumatized, respond with the deepest forms of healing. You will be terrorized for 400 years. Respond with a commitment to freedom, which means you're not in it for popularity. Mm. You don't want to put a slap your grandmama in the grave by telling her that you succumb to the gutter mm. rather than held up certain bloodstained banners of freedom, integrity, honesty, generosity, and truth telling. And the condition of truth is always what? To allow suffering to speak. Yeah. Mm. There is no truth in the human condition unless we listen to those in the language of Malcolm who are catching hell. Mm. And that's the exact opposite we see in the White House and so many state houses, but not just in politics. We've seen it more and more in our churches, well, in our mosque, well. in our synagogue. We've seen it more and more in our educational institutions where corporatization, commodification, Commercialization, money, 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 status, 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 power, power, power. And what kind of sign does that send to the, our young people? Well, Thank God when I was coming along, we had ministers, professors, we had politicians that said they would rather be in the language of the great Mary Ellen Pleasant. You all know who Mary Ellen Pleasant was now. The mother of human rights in California, right? The first black woman who was a multimillionaire. She was worth $647 million in the 1840s. Okay. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Mary Ellen Pleasant, before Madam J. Walker. Mm. She married a vanilla brother who dropped dead and she reheaded it to money. <laughs> That'd be $647 million a day. She had it. What did she do? She gave a million dollars to John Brown. He was the vanilla brother who loved black people more than many black people loved themselves. That's right. A million dollars to John Brown. Deal with the Underground Railroad. Here's the cash. I'm a real estate magnet. Take the money. Mm. That's Mary Ann Pleasant, San Francisco. That's it. You see, San Francisco. 
but she is one moment in a larger tradition. Some folk have less money and say, take my service, take my time, take my energy. I'm going to focus on little Jamal. You focus on J Jamila. I'm going to focus on Susan. You focus on Jose. And one of the wonderful things about the tradition that produced we black people is that when the love is deep enough to start on the chocolate side of town and it's real, right. it spills over to the vanilla side. But sometimes but people struggle with there. that. But it doesn't start there. Because that's the last thing you need is black people who love everybody but, but black people. Yep. That's, that's the last it. thing you need. But if you love black people deep enough and it's real and concrete, then it's going to move to the barrio. It's going to move to the reservation with indigenous people. It's going to move to the Irish and the Jewish and the Polish because that love is something that is inside of you, something that you have experienced at the deepest level. That's why our musicians are so paradigmatic. That's why they're the model. Because we understand when John Coltrane's talking about love supreme, he's not just talking about the love of a slice. Right. He's talking about a love that begins with the least of these. Those catching hell in the language of Malcolm X and then spilling over, then raising your voices. So here we are in 2019 saying, well, where are the voices that are willing to tell the truth right. about the gangster in the White House? <laughs> tell the truth about it. But as we talked about last, last year as well, yeah. to recognize you say, oh, brother, why should you call him a gangster? No, that's, that, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's right. That's not a subjective expression. That's an objective condition. <laughs> gangsters are gangsters based on evidence. <laughs> brother Willie Brown knows I grew up on the chocolate side of Sacramento, and I know there's gangster inside of me. Mm. Mm. I know what it's like to be a gangster. I grew up with some gangsters. When I met Jesus and decided, lo and behold, I'm a redeemed sinner now with gangster proclivities. <laughs> and I'm honest about thugs and gangsters in high places. Whatever color they come in, to keep them accountable across the board. Mm -hmm. There's the primacy of the moral, primacy of the spiritual that has a systemic analysis of the system under which we live, which is one of empire. That's why we should never say this nation is a nation of immigrants. That's a lie. When you hear it on the neoliberal corporate media, you say to yourself, that's a lie. <laughs> Indigenous peoples were here. Mm. Thousands and thousands and thousands. Anytime they say U.S. slavery is America's original sin, that's a neoliberal lie. That was the second sin. Yeah. But don't say it's original. We don't need to highlight black suffering in such a way that it downplays somebody else's suffering. Mm. White supremacy began as an imperial attempt to engage in the stealing of this land for looking for gold. That's California's story in part, gold rush. And what happens in a society in which you view life as a gold rush, you end up worshiping the golden calf. Mm. And the golden rule becomes he or she rules who has the gold. And those who have very little power pushed more and more to the margin. So we need voices, mm -hmm. institutions like civil rights, the Human Rights Commission and others. We need churches, mosques, synagogues, civic institutions, trade unions, professors, everyday peoples raising their voices in the name of a love and justice that tells the truth about the people in power and brings pressure to bear to change it. But it's hard these days in a market-driven society to even get to truth. Just like in war, truth is the first casualty. So it is in this battlefield that we find ourselves on. It's hard to even get the people who are telling the truth. Everybody concerned about their careers, concerned yeah. about the next opportunity, concerned about th their particular move, their upward mobility st strategic move. What happened to the truth? Well, oh, so but young folk hungry for it. Can, but can I ask oh, you, so yeah, you, you said a, so long, young folk no, 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 you gave a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave a lot. <laughs> I'm trying to like, 
you, 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 I, I had a bunch of questions Lord, and all that you were saying. Yeah, no. uh, <laughs> oh, Lord, yeah. But, but I'm, another book, I know everybody's looking forward to uh, Race Matters, revisiting that, but this book, Black Prophetic Fire, and you mentioned um, Ella Baker. Oh, Sister Ella. You talked about inside-outside game, right? Absolutely. And in this, I, I was going to say to you, you are both a prophet and a scholar. I feel like you, you are prophetic in, uh, in and of the work that you do. But you said here, I think in many ways, Ella Baker is the most relevant of our historic figures when it comes to democratic forms of leadership. When it comes to a deep and abiding love for not just black people in the abstract or poor people in the abstract, but a deep commitment to their capacities and their abilities to think critically, to organize themselves, and to think systematically in terms of opposition to and transformation of a system. And so as you talk about where we are right now, and we look at what's happened, what they call the squad, right? Yes, when we yes, think about these yes. women that are taking leadership, right? Where are we in that prophetic fire that you think about, that you talk about, the Ella Bakers of the world? Do those women represent that to you? Oh, absolutely. It's within the electoral political system, mm. which even requires a certain more special kind of courage. You see, it's one thing to tell the truth on the outside. It's another thing when you get inside with the constructual constraints and you recognize that if you say certain things, you might lose your job or get, be ca cast in such a way mm. that you no longer are effective within those circumscribed contexts. That's what the electoral political system is, you see. And we'll have more time to talk about that mm. as well, you see. And that's what they're in. Mm -hmm. So they like Adam Clayton Powell. They're like Brother Harold Washington, Brother Willie Brown. To be inside of that system. And Brother Willie will tell us, boy, you can suffocate in that, oh, can't you? <laughs> Ooh, can't you suffocate, though, brother? Oh, because the permanent government is always big business. They always already there. They know you rotating. They not rotating. Hmm. I remember hmm. when we broke our neck for David Dinkins. And, and at the first meeting, I said, Brother David, uh, you know the permanent government's going to be coming at you. That's Wall Street. What you talking about, Brother West? You'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm mayor of New York City. Come on now, man. No, 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 no. Luther Vandross is the real mayor. <laughs> he the one that got the freedom. You locked in. You locked in. But we're going to put pressure to, to give you some more space. So that working people and poor people's interests and principles can have more resonance and have more gravity in that way. You see. And so it is, I think, in terms of, uh, of where we are now with these four sisters. They, to me, have been exemplary in their courage, and they're so young. Mm. Good God almighty. Yeah. Yeah. They're so young. They have to deal with those vicious lies where their very lives are at stake. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and someone just got here just a few years ago, a few decades ago, in the United States from a blessed country named Somalia. Mm. Somalia has produced some great, powerful figures. There's another with Sister Omar. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico. Oh, my God. What's happening in Puerto Rico right now? Right, right. Puerto Rico's still a colony. Abiso's Campos' daughter just died. Laura just died two, two months ago. Raising up, hitting the streets. America has a colony, you don't say. <laughs> Where do you think Philippines was? Where do you think Guam was? Where do you think Cuba was? Where do you think Samoa was? Where are we right now? It used to be Mexico. How do you think we got it? Socratic dialogue? <laughs> <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant said one of the most unjust wars in the history of the annals of war. Mm. Mexico lost half of its country. That's called gentrification <laughs> on a global scale. Mm. Just come in grabbing power and land. This is mine. How does it get to be mine? Because I want it. Mm. Where did that come from? Mike doesn't make right. We didn't learn that in where we grew up. That's gangster orientation. You don't say we call it manifest destiny. Mm. That's American imperialism. That's why America began as an empire. It was a corporation before it was a country. It's always been concerned with resources. It's been those Americans of all colors 
who had the moral and spiritual maturity and courage to say, we want to create a democratic experiment within the context of this imperial project. But see, most Americans don't even realize they live in an empire. Right. Uh -huh. Most Americans didn't even know we bombed nine countries last year. Mm. Four of them in Africa. Five of them in the Middle East. Mm. Most of them don't know we dropped 26,000 bombs. Some of those bombs killed some people. And I come from a tradition I learned in vacation Bible school in Shiloh Baptist Church. Jesus loved the little children, all the children, children of the, the world, world, black and yellow. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious. In his sight. Y'all learn it in Texas and Bay Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but but I as you say that, that, though. Those children are precious in Somalia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. they precious in Palestine. they precious in Tel Aviv. they precious in Guatemala. they precious in Ethiopia, across the board. How do we allow ourselves to be used for a larger democratic aim? You can call it human rights, you can call it freedom, you can call it equality, but it's just being a force for good, because I'm not in the isms at all. I'm a Christian, so I don't give a about worldly isms. <laughs> you see, if you ain't got no love in it, it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbal for me. Right. I don't care how correct your analysis is. If you're not willing to sacrifice something and cut against the grain, then you're just posing and posturing. Then you're just acting like a peacock. I'm in the eagles. <laughs> I'm not in the foliage. I'm in the fruits. It's not what you seem and what you're wearing. It's what kind of fruit are you bearing. Mm. What kind of effects and consequences are at work in the people you meet, in the society you live in, in the words you use, in the grin that you leave, and the laugh that you enact, you see. And that is the best of America. It's not just the best of America, it's the best of human spirit, but it's the best of America. And we have a tradition of the best in America, like Martin King and others, just like we got a history of traditions of gangsters, like the president. <laughs> it's true. Mm. And both of them are as American as apple pie. <laughs> you see? That's why you just can't talk about getting rid of the president and going back to normal. Right. <sighs> what you think normal, normal? was? Mm -hmm. Mass incarceration, decrepit schools, massive unemployment and underemployment, grotesque wealth inequality, is that your normal? No. Oh, but oh my God, before Trump, America was such a pleasant place. What uh -huh. kind of neighborhood <laughs> you live in? <laughs> what kind of moral scope do you have in the neighborhood you live in? Mm. You know all the hell people were catching before Trump. Right. Even I know Obama. God bless him. Symbolic indictment of white supremacy. Hey, I broke there for at least one afternoon. But I stopped that evening. You know, people mad at you I about that. I stopped that evening. I broke down <laughs> three hours straight. Made MC Hammer look like a Boy Scout. <laughs> I was happy because that's an indictment of white supremacy in a symbolic way. Then the question becomes, now what kind of substance are we talking about? Mm. That's the question. Are we going to focus on issues of race? Are we going to have a serious engagement with the new Jim Crow? Are we going to bail out homeowners rather than Wall Street? Are we going to cut back on the national surveillance state? Are we going to cut back on dropping the bombs? Those are the issues of an empire. That's W.B. Du Bois. That's Victoria Garvin. That's Angela Davis. That's Malcolm X. Those are the free ones. None of them have a monopoly on the truth. None of us do as persons. Some of them are Christians like Martin. Some of them are Muslims like Malcolm, some of them are agnostic like James Baldwin and Audre Lorde. Some of them are, are bisexual like Langston Hughes. Comes in a lot of different forms. But what happened was we lost and we're losing contact with the best of our tradition. And so we're ending up with these weak copies and semblances and simulacra. A simulacra is a copy of a copy. Hmm. You see, so when I was growing up, Ashford and Simpson, you sing about the real thing. Ain't nothing like 
the real thing. Have you ever tried it for yourself? Still getting it secondhand from someone else. These days, it's hard to get the real thing. And the young people are hungry for it, and they get a copy and think they got the real thing. Hmm. Hmm. Said, oh, Lord, it's like thinking, lo and behold, I love Beyonce. She's the greatest entertainer alive. <laughs> but she ain't no Aretha. <laughs> when she comes to Coachella, she is visionary, courageous. She brings the whole tradition with her. Aretha, Ella, Billy, Carmen, she brought all of them with her. She elevated herself by bringing the whole tradition with her. I salute Beyonce. She understood that she's part of a tradition, but she also knows I'm Queen B. She's the queen. Hmm. Well, And that's not generational. It has to do with the depth of spirituality, a depth of courage that is manifest in the marriage of craft and imagination, manifest in how you touch people's souls. She's a soul stirrer. That is the real thing. When you stir people's souls, like Sam Cooke and Johnny Taylor and Lou Rawls, and young folk these days are hungry for that kind of real thing, and it's there, but they don't see it enough. They just don't see it. And if they, if they don't see it enough and begin to imitate the imitation, they're going to lose out on the real substance. Right. And if you lose out on the real substance, then when it's time to be tested, and by being tested, you will be in the fire. Mm. And that's when you find out who you really are. Right. And you drop, you, you, when you dropped in the fire and recognize you're not really ready, hmm. you're not really prepared, you're either going to pose and posture like you are, or you're going to tell the truth and say, you know what? I'm in over my head. Just like the president, <laughs> I'm in over my head. <laughs> And this is, and I'm talking especially in the black community here. But, but as you talk, talk about the black. black community, you talk about tradition, you talk about spirituality, one of the questions here is about um, really the old school way of, one of the reasons I got initially on the Human Rights Commission is that certain things are still very taboo in the black community. Mm. When you talk about LGBTQ issues, when you talk about transgender issues, and this question is about um, how do we deal with the discomfort still within the black community sometimes to have those conversations and see people as people, the humanity of folks, yeah. to celebrate that, to move beyond the old school traditions and ways of thinking. But this is where the issue comes back to love again. Comes back to love again. And you see, deep, canotic, self-emptying love never goes out of style. Mm. I don't care what generation it is. So if you think that somehow you can love black people, but not love James Baldwin, hmm. or not love Luther Vandross, because hmm. he's gay, you need to check yourself. Or you walk into your church and see that brother playing that organ. Hmm. <laughs> God bless him. And everybody know he's gay as James Baldwin. <laughs> everybody know that. But you're going to sit up there and lie. Hmm. It's lying. Then you got folk in the pulpit. Well, well. In the pew, on the down low. Just be honest. Just be candid. And say, we humans beings, like everybody else, love comes in a number of different forms. Don't make us better because we love an X and Y. Don't make us worse. We just human. And lo and behold, we need to be accountable like everybody else. Let's bring our resources, our imaginations, our courage together in order to be stronger forces for good. Cross the board. But if you're going to truncate love, if you're going to bottle it up, same is true with patriarchy. Oh, the women can't preach right. in this. In well, the pulpit, how in the world are you going to fight white supremacy with all of its various levels and only got one arm? <laughs> it ain't clear with both arms we're going to win, but at least we can go down swinging with both. And so in that sense, it's a matter of both moral and spiritual quality in terms of what goes into the embrace of those who have different ways in which their love is expressed, but also very practically. We need all the voices. Now, thank God our anthem is Lift Every Voice. Okay. Doesn't just say Lift Every Straight Voice. <laughs> oh, that's not James. 
That's not James Weldon Johnson. That's not Rosamond Johnson. It's lift every voice. But it doesn't say lift every echo. Mm. Mm. So you don't want no echo chambers. Mm. You can't be a jazz man or a blues woman without finding your voice. If you're just going to be an echo, then go to the choreography. The, the, what is that? What's that club they got there? Co co karaoke okay. club. Yeah, go, go to the karaoke. <laughs> Just echo what the folk are doing. If you're going to find your own voice like your fingerprint, that's inside of each and every one of us. Mm. And that's how we find our callings, our vocations. An invocation, grandmama's voice in us. Granddad's afterlife in our life. That's the caravan of love that the Isley Brothers singing about. That's the tradition of love and justice that comes out of a hated people that opens itself to the world. And that's what is leading partly toward the, the staleness of our society. Mm -hmm. Because there once was a time when we actually could go to major black institutions and voices and hear something free mm -hmm. and truthful. Mm. Now, it may have the chance of a snowball in hell of being translated because <laughs> black freedom has always been a taboo in a white supremacist civilization. Mm. But people could raise their voices. They could walk like they free. They could laugh like Richard Pryor, mm. free man. They could swing like Muhammad Ali, free man. They could sing like Ella with swing. Swing ain't nothing but what? Freedom. Stay away from the flatness of the notes. Be on top, on the side, through it, everywhere but on the note. <laughs> That's called a blue note. <laughs> That's freedom of a people who every day unfree. Jack Johnson, free in the ring. The only space in the whole white supremacist civilization was a ring. That was the only space he could find fairness. He's knocking Vanilla Brothers out. <laughs> And he was viewed as what? A free man who was a major threat. Because when the rules are fair, here come black folk, here come brown folk, here come Asian folk, here come white poor folk. Just set the rules in such a way that they're fair and you'll see your white supremacy and patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia begin to melt. Mm. It begins to just melt. <laughs> Not because anybody's better, but because the rules are fair. But oh, how hard it is to make, to make the rules fair. You see? Right. Somebody right. got to fight, somebody got to live, somebody got to die to do that. Right. Absolutely. So you, you reference, because I know you are a lover of music, and uh, your uh, album and the song you did with Prince, Mr. Man. Oh, but we miss Prince. Right. Oh, we miss Prince. Oh, Lord. And, and this, yeah. this line in here, mm. listen, ain't no sense in voting. Same song with a different name. Might not be in the back of the bus, but it show sure feel just the same. Ain't nothing fair about welfare. Ain't no assistance in AIDS. Ain't nothing aff affirmative about your actions till you, the people get paid. Mm. And all this discussion back and forth about voting rights and whether young people feel like it's worth voting with everything that's going on, how do you change that line? Ain't no sense in voting. Yeah, and that Prince, Prince's genius is beyond description, but he's wrong about that particular line. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. But we don't, we don't, we don't want to confuse the, uh, the forest from the trees, because Prince is one of the great exemplars of the freedom that I'm talking about. Uh, and you all know he wouldn't allow any of the hip-hop artists to sample his music. And so when we went in to ask him to do that, he said yes, and it was really quite a uh, blessing and an honor to do that. But Prince also was influenced by another genius named Larry Graham of uh, Sly and Family Stone and Graham Station. What was the name of his group? The uh, Graham Central Station. Graham Central Station. That's it, Graham I would overlook that Central. <laughs> that Central Station. And both of them Jehovah Witness. Mm. You see, so Jehovah Witness got their own sensibilities. Michael Jackson grew up Jehovah's Witness, one of the greatest of all black geniuses in, in the last 50 years. Ken Gamble, Gamble and Huff grew up Jehovah's Witness, and they don't believe in voting. It's just like 
Nation of Islam for many years didn't believe in voting until Brother Jesse ran, right? So you got, we got certain groups in our community that we push and try to hold accountable. We have conversations and dialogues with them, and many of them don't believe in electoral politics. Mm -hmm. And I think they're wrong about that. I think we have to use all forms of weaponry. Yeah. Mm. We've got spiritual, moral, political, economic forms of weaponry. But we also have to be honest and candid and tell ourselves and others the truth. You see, we can't think that, we can't argue our politicians are going to be agents of salvation. That's a lie. That's a lie. Our politicians cannot be as free given the structural constraints. They can be forces for good, but they cannot be as free. So yes, we must vote, but we don't vote for mayors. When my dear brother was mayor of San Francisco, the last thing you ever want to say to people, to black people, is I'm the Messiah. I'm going to bring you salvation. Is that right, my brother? No Absolutely. <laughs> you say, I'm a human being in here, and I'm swinging. And I got to make decisions, and forces are coming at me, and interests are coming at me, and I need your support, not just on the inside, but on the outside. Sometimes you agree, sometimes you disagree, but don't pose me as some messiah. Hmm. No, if you need that, go to your church and make sure the messiah is not your pastor, but Bigger than your pastor. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. You see? Mm -hmm. So in that way, what Prince was simply saying was, given my perspective, no one perspective of any of us has a monopoly on truth. Mm -hmm. He said, but you notice a lot of times when you do support some of these politicians, things don't change too much. Mm. That's what Prince was saying. Mm. That's real. So we got to say that to the young folk recognize that voting is just one moment in your arsenal that has to do with how you can be a self-respecting, self-determining, free human being. Mm. Not just successful, but great. But great. And that's what I love about the best of my tradition. Right. We have always had an habitual vision of greatness. That's why the greatest among us was rarely the richest among us. Mm, mm. Nobody knows who the richest Negro in Atlanta was in 1968, but they remember Martin. Mm. Nobody remembers who the richest Negro in Harlem was in 65, but they remember Malcolm. Or the richest Negro in Mississippi, we shall never forget Fanny or the richest Negro in Los Angeles, thank God for Angela Davis. Greatness and success don't always overlap. Mm. And if you are successful and you want to be great, then you better have a quality of service connected with your success. Yeah. Mm. That you actually are helping somebody else out. Mm -hmm. Like D Dorothy Irene Height, lifting right. Right. as she climbed. That's the best of the Deltas and the AKA and the upper middle class black sisters. The beautiful tradition right. at its best, at its worst, idolizing success, ending up peacocks. I say that about my alpha brother. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud to be an alpha, but Lord, I got some alpha brothers who need some prayer. <laughs> <laughs> like I do. Like fiction. But we got down to Hathaway and Du Bois and, Mar uh, and Martin King and a whole host of others. And they it manifest greatness as well as success. You see? And the greatness is the key. So, with That's that kind of criteria, so much, one of the, the questions is um, if you, who's checking the boxes for you right now in terms of presidential candidates? Oh, good question, good question, good question. <laughs> Very good question. Well, the first thing is, you know, you don't want to fetishize any of the candidates. And by fetishize, what I mean is ascribe magical powers to them. Hmm. You see, the last thing we need to be would just be spectators who watch the horse race and vote and thinking we made a major contribution to democracy. <laughs> democracy requires so much more than that. To be a serious citizen of great substance, 
and content. You got to be involved on a number of different levels. Now, I happen to be a social movement person, so I like to keep track of the social movements, you see. Mm -hmm. Occupy movement, what were they saying? 1% own 42% of the wealth. Top three individuals have wealth equivalent to the bottom 160 million. All oh, those crazy folk out there next to Wall Street, why don't they take a bath and go on home and go to school? No, they're raising some issues. Then here come Brother Bernie mm -hmm. within the electoral political system. Raise the same issues. Four years ago with Brother Bernie, of course, we hit the, we hit the country. We must have done over 150 events together. And uh, they thought we had lost our mind. <laughs> it's true. We were in Seattle just nine years ago talking about $15 an hour, and they called us communists. I said, no, I'm a Christian, but you can call me anything <laughs> you want. Don't make no difference to me. He said, $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. You're talking about free tuition, public institutions of higher learning. Now it's called elimination of debt. Now it's interesting because the Democratic Party has a number of candidates, many of whom begin where Bernie ended, four years ago. Hmm. You see, that's what it means for a politician to be a thermostat rather than a thermometer. Hmm. See, most politicians just reflect the climate of opinion, especially if they've studied the polls. <laughs> Some politicians shape the climate of opinion like a thermostat. That's what Brother Bernie is able to do, but Bernie didn't do it by himself. It was the Occupy movement. Black Lives Matter the same way. You got Black Lives Matter movement under black president, black attorney general, and black homeland security. Mm. What does that mean? Courage is not a function of skin pigmentation, is it? Mm -mm. You need something more than just being beautifully black. I love beautifully black people. Clarence <laughs> Thomas is beautifully black. I keep track of that Negro. <laughs> <laughs> I keep track of him. He's a beautiful black man. And if the police is beating him up, I'm on his side against the police, but as soon as that's over, <laughs> I'm gonna keep that Negro accountable. 96% he sided with the wealthy and the powerful rather than the everyday people. That's a moral issue, it's a spiritual issue, it's not a function of skin pigmentation. And we have to say it over and over and over again because people think that somehow this magic of blackness hmm. makes you inherently progressive and courageous. Well, you say, what kind of history book you been reading? Who? And yet at the same time, you have to acknowledge that blackness is so thoroughly degraded and hated and treated with disgust in a white supremacist civilization. Right. So you have to be able to keep track of the love of self and the love of human beings who are Africans and of black pigmentation and still by keeping track of their humanity recognize they can be thugs and gangsters too. Well. That they can be cowardly, they can be complacent, they can be complicitous with structures of domination. And we in America, I mean we gotta be honest about it and this is part of our problem these days, you know, that. Uh, it's been often said by the great F. O. Matheson that America is unique among nations to move from perceived innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity. <laughs> very powerful statement. It's a very powerful statement. Because America as an empire, it's like the Persian Empire, and we were talking about Cyrus with the sister Alex on the uh, talking about earlier uh, with, with, with Sister Ali and, and Amy, the Persian Empire had its high moments with Cyrus and met his defeat at the Battle of Marathon. The Roman Empire, oh my God, the British Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ottoman Empire, America has been an empire. It is an empire in decline and decay, and if it does not regenerate itself and learn and listen from the best voices, it will go under like any other empire. America does, God does not look on America and somehow give us a nice little nod hmm. and say, 
I'm always for you. You my special ones. You my chosen people. <laughs> no, if you don't follow through and do justice like any other empire, you lose your empire. You lose the best of it. <laughs> and that's a fundamental fact. And these days with the, with the candidates like Brother Bernie for it was true for, for, for Sister AOC and others, oh, America's going to go socialist. Well, look, let's look at this now. <laughs> the Pledge of, Pledge of Allegiance written by a democratic socialist, Francis Bellamy. The song, America the Beautiful, written by Catherine Lee Bates, democratic socialist. America's greatest poet, Walt Whitman, democratic socialist. America's greatest philosopher, John Dewey, democratic socialist. Greatest Christian social ethicist, Reinhold Niebuhr, democratic socialist. Martin Luther King Jr., I ain't got no language for that brother, <laughs> ends up democratic socialist. Helen Keller, mm -hmm. deaf, mute, blind, graduate of Radcliffe, democratic socialist. We can go on and on. We ain't got the Jack London from Oakland yet. <laughs> we ain't got the Harry Bridges yet. And we ain't got to agree with everything about them. But democratic socialism in its varieties is as American as apple pie, mm. as apple pie. But the claim is, anytime you talk about socialism, you must be talking about the Soviet Union, you must be talking about China under Mao, and so forth and so on. No, that's not just American ignorance, and we saw it with Lindsey Graham. You all see Lindsey Graham the other day? <laughs> that was the Donald Duck version of Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> that's what that was. It was a cartoonist version of the hysteria charging against communists like Harry Bridges and others. That's what it was. Robeson, Du Bois, all of them. Angela Davis, cross the board. But it's not going to work for the younger generation the way it did in the 1950s. You ain't going to get a black list of, of, of Hollywood. You're not going to get professors who were pushed out of their jobs across the board the way you did in the 1950s. You're not going to send Claudia Jones to London because she's a member of the Communist Party. Hmm. That's played out. That's over. But they're trying to use the same playbook. Because if they can just charge anybody with being a communist, somehow you're dismissed. And I must say, anytime people call me a communist, I say in the name of Jesus, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Thank you, because I can tell you my critique of communism when it's tied to domination and repression and regimentation, but I can tell you anybody who falls in love with the struggle for poor and working people in their various ways and they're willing to sacrifice, they are significantly comrades to the degree to which they are willing to bring critique to bear on the powers that be. And so in that sense, we ought not to be afraid and scared and intimidated. And that's crucial because the history of the black movement is to keep people's, black people so, keep us so afraid and scared and intimidated, laughing when it ain't funny, scratching when it well. don't itch, wearing the mask, always trying to fit in, well adjusted to injustice. Oh, we just can't wait to fit in and get white approval and white recognition and the white pat on the back. Oh, is that what makes you feel good? You think that's what Louis Armstrong was blowing in his horn? For white approval? He wanted the cash, but he knew the standards had something to do with Buddy Bolden. Mm -hmm. You think Sarah Vaughn sang the way she did just for white approval? Mm -hmm. You think that Manuel Scott Ooh. and Gardner Taylor preached the way they did because they want approval from white mm -hmm. pastors on the vanilla side of town? You better get off the crack pipe. <laughs> Get off the crack pipe. <laughs> oh, we got some internal standards of the highest folk. You think grandmama loved you as a black child in order to get white's approval of you? Then you never understood who grandmama really was. She loved you because she knew you were precious, irreducible. No comparison to you. And lo and behold, there's a tradition of that that goes all the way. It ain't got nothing to do with putting anybody else down. Mm. It got everything to do with putting you up 
in this society where the systems, the structures are geared and designed to put you down. Mm -hmm. Here's some self-respect. Here's some self-determination. Here's some self-love that is a counter voice against what is in place. Now that to me is the starting point. And that's why it's spiritual as well as moral. That's why it's moral as well as political. Mm -hmm. It's political as well as economic. It goes hand in hand. But we must never compartmentalize it and think that we got our artists over here in this corner. Isn't it nice that they provide such soothing entertainment? <laughs> no. Uh -uh. If they're not stirring your soul, if they're not fortifying you for struggle, then it is superficial entertainment. But that's not the truth for the great artists that, that come out of our tradition. So, so I guess before I move to the next one, I guess yeah. uh, all I heard is Bernie. <laughs> is that is that is that the only is that that's you you know you're in San Francisco right? Oh like, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm in California. No, it's true. It's true. But what I was saying was is that you know I, 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 yeah, I love my dear brother Bernie, but all I was saying was you know we 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 we've got to be. <laughs> We got to be critical supporters of those in the electoral political system. You see, I'm glad to see Sister Harris run. She's brilliant. She's poised. I was love. I, I loved how she tried to render Brother Biden accountable the other day. Mm. It's gonna happen again. <laughs> it's gonna happen again. You see. Yeah. But I'm not convinced that my dear Sister Harris has consistently been progressive and on the side of poor and working people in the same way Bernie has been. Mm -hmm. see. Now, I have a lot of good friends, especially my, my, my AKA sisters and others. So, yeah. oh, I understand, I lift every voice, and of course, <laughs> Sister Harris is a zillion miles better than Trump, but I mean, Trump <laughs> being better than Trump is like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this bar is about this low. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, and the same is true with Sister Elizabeth Warren. I have great, great uh, love and respect for her, just like I do, Sister. Uh, oh, sorry, Sister. Ooh, tell this you call it Bernie back. right here. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about you, brother. I'm talking about you, but I'm being honest. I'm being honest. <laughs> oh, that's right. He, he knows I'm critical of everybody, even when I tilt in certain directions. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> But no, but the uh, but 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 you know, Sister Elizabeth Warren is you know she's strong. There's no there's no doubt about. It. I must say this though that uh, none of the candidates have been able to come to terms with America's empire and the foreign policy in the way that I like it. You see, they don't want to really tell the truth about the Israeli occupation. They don't want to tell the truth about it. Bernie's moving in that direction. We put a lot of pressure on. Him. And it's a difficult thing because we must always stay in contact with the rich humanity of our precious Jewish brothers and sisters. And we tell them, this ain't got nothing to do at our best with succumbing to the vicious, ugly tradition of anti-Jewish hatred that is set at the center of so many Christian and Muslim civilizations. Those are facts that can never be denied. But the vicious forms of treating our precious Jewish brothers and sisters must never allow us to hide and conceal the way Israeli occupation can lose sight of precious Palestinian brothers and sisters. And we have to say over and over again, a Palestinian baby has exactly the same value as a Jewish baby. Mm. And a Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby. Neither side has a monopoly of truth, but an occupation is an occupation. Kashmir, Tibet, Western Sub-Sahara, those are all occupations. We have to be honest about that asymmetric relation of power, that structure of domination. That's the beginning, but also in terms of the wars. Mm -hmm. Look at the Democrats' vote for Trump's $750 billion military budget. Wow. Did we hear any major critiques of it coming out of the Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. And this, I know Sister Nancy just right across the way here. <laughs> Sister Pelosi herself, God bless and be with her. 
Jesus keep me near the cross, God dang it. <laughs> but as speaker of the house, you see, you got to be able to keep the vision alongside your practical calculations. And if the pro practical calculations begin to truncate some of your vision, then you need serious critique. Same is true with the bombing of Libya, um, of Syria, with the Trump. When Trump bombed Syria, what do you get out of so many Democrats? Well, he's finally acting like a president. Oh, so that's what presidents do, is learn how to bomb, huh? Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Get out of my way with that John Wayne mentality. Mm. This ain't no cowboys versus Indians. I thought we were beyond that. Martin Luther King Jr. died talking about what? Poverty, racism, materialism, and what else? Militarism. Mm. War. Dro bombs dropped in Libya, Syria, Mali, Niger, Pakistan, Afghanistan, across the board. They land in hoods mm. with no money for education, no money for health care. Can't find the money. Oh, we got a budgetary austerity we must promote. But we notice when it comes to finding money for wars, all of a sudden it just the money flows like water. Those are the kind of things that need to be addressed. And unfortunately, in most of our presidential uh, 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 discussions or discussions about president, foreign policy hardly surfaces. I don't think mm. there was a serious discussion of it in that last debate. Mm. Not at all. For every dollar spent, 60 cents goes to military industrial complex. Wow. So you got 40 cents to deal with all your other problems. Priorities need to be revamped. And that's one of the ways in which I think we have to keep track of these various politicians. It could be Brother Pete, Brother Corey. You know, I, I've got a great love for Brother Corey. I've known him since he was a student. Brother Pete Buttigieg, his father was like a blood brother to me. Uh, Joseph Buttigieg, his father just, just died. In fact, Pete's mother was telling me, she said, you know, Brother West, uh, I'll never forget that you gave Brother Pete uh, uh, five dollars when he was three years old, right inside <laughs> of his, his short pants. I said, is that right? He said, yeah, he got so excited. I said, oh, okay. Now, the thing about Pete is I love him to death like I do Corey, like I do Sister Harris and so forth, but I'm just not convinced that two things, they have the kind of tenacity to be progressive in, when it really gets difficult. And two, I don't think that Trump can be beat unless you can generate such a high level of energy and enthusiasm and vision. But this neoliberal milquetoast-centrism mm. is not going to be strong enough to overcome that right-wing crypto-fascist <laughs> energy on the, on the right. You got to be able to move people. You got to be able to set them on fire, not with necessarily rhetoric, mm. but with ideas and vision. And one of the things about Brother Bernie, even though he's, he's slightly older brother. <laughs> slightly. Bernie, he got some folk on fire. Mm. And they're on fire for the right reasons, because he has a longevity of consistency and integrity and courage. Oh, he's saying the same thing he did four years ago. You want somebody who's saying something different every four years? <laughs> 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 what, what the, he's hit, not hitting race hard enough. Let's put the pressure on him. He's not highlighting reparations. Let's put the pressure on him. I'm a reparations man. He's moving in that way. I don't have to agree with everybody on everything. Lift every voice. Hmm. But keep in mind that as crucial as I think reparations are, reparations is not the litmus test for those who are struggling against racism. Within the black freedom tradition, you got some magnificent warriors against white supremacy who did not for reparations. You can't push Thurgood Marshall out just because he wasn't obsessed with reparations. He did more than almost anybody did when it comes to wrestling with that within the legal system. He just thought reparations, 
Pie in the sky. Okay, we understand a lot of things pie in the sky, Thurgood. You just keep doing what you're doing. You're still a comrade. We just disagree on that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree on everything. This is not a military band. This is a jazz orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you got a jazz Yeah, that's right. Gonzalez is blowing a different way. Duke, Duke, what you gonna say? Gonzalez is blowing this way. Johnny Hodges is blowing. Hey, hey, that's what they feeling tonight, you know? <laughs> Isn't that true? Lift heavy voice. That's what Miles told Coltrane, though, didn't he? Miles is your quartet. How come you take three minutes and train takes 19 minutes? Takes him that long to say what he got to say. <laughs> Miles and Linda, you go up to train with train. How come you just kept playing? I just had to get it all out. I didn't know how to stop. Miles said, well, just take the horn out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when it's time, but he, Miles let him do it, though, didn't he? He wouldn't, didn't have his ego. I, this is my quintet. I'm going to pay 18 train. You pay three. Mm -hmm. That's what big folk would do nowadays. And they would get that from where? They'd get it from their agents and their spinsters. Miles, you know you're not gonna get the same kind of contracts if you just allow Train to keep blowing. Next thing you know, it's gonna be Train's quartet. Get out of my mouth, thanks. <laughs> train is my brother. Hmm. Take him that long, take him that long. <laughs> That's freedom. That's security. He's still himself. Now, he got a problem on the woman question. We know that. He kind of like the R. Kelly of his day. In well, I level, feel a little bit I mean? like you culture. He's he wrong as he can Miles. be. <laughs> Miles wrong as he can be, but when he starts playing that music through his horn and it touches your soul, then you don't think immediately of Cicely Tyson being attacked. Mm. You still should think about it. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but you don't reduce the genius of his music to the gangsterism of his actions. You remember both of them together because he's a human being who's wrong, and he's an artist who can turn your world upside down if you listen closely to Kind of Blue. And that's the kind of re uh, openness as well as accountability, I think, that we need. And I, I again, thank God for the uh, San Francisco Human Rights Commission and the Commonwealth Club for uh, allowing the kind of discussions that we're trying to enact here to take place because um, it is so badly needed. In the end, I don't think it's going to be a question of who has the best plan. It's not going to be a question in the end of uh, who's head in the polls. It's going to be who can energize and re revitalize the people in a direction that's over against the kind of gangster leadership and gangster policies of a brother named Donald Trump with a precious mother named Mary Ann who got here in 1930. Mm. But I say as a black man who's been here for nine generations, my dear sister, I don't want you to go back. Mm. I don't want you to go back. Come on in the empire and try to make it more democratic. My slave ancestors built the country. Mm. Neo-slavery, Jim Crow, sustained the country while you came in. So if anybody has the authority other than indigenous peoples to define what is an American, mm. you look looking at nine generations of folk who helped build this, but you don't hear from us, go back to where you came from. Because well. we don't stay in the gutter. We don't stay in the moral and spiritual gutter. We know we got gangster elements inside of us, but at our best, we reconquer it every day. We die every day in order to be better persons, more courageous, more critical, more visionary, reaching out to folk all around the country and the world. Welcome, Miss Mary Ann Tri Her name was McLeod from Scotland. <laughs> and we say that to all the white brothers and sisters who get here after one generation and want to be definitive in terms of defining what it is to be America. Well. Well, uh, Dr. West putting his mic down, I guess, is the equivalent of the mic drop. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, no, we... I got, you got no, questions, that's fine. No, no, I, I do, but unfortunately, we're, we're at time. Oh, 
Oh, but the spirit don't function by time, though. <laughs> see, see. But I know you are you are getting tired. Though. They, if they if they getting tired, I, I well, do understand Well, if you would them. indulge but me, I do have a couple, a couple of, of yes. But I, I I try to be very sure. And you should answer some of these questions too, given your vision there. Well, no. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. I hand this mic to you. <laughs> I'm gonna let you have it. All right, all right. Because <laughs> you right. are the cold train on this stage tonight. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> So a couple of questions that I think um, speak to some of what you've said about on the national level. People are asking, what do we do nationally but also locally? What does leadership look like? How do we embrace that? But at the same time, when we think about black wealth in terms of who is symbolic of that, Right, and, and this idea that it's capitalism and that is what is pushing and driving. How do we encourage young people to be more social justice minded, right? In this age when Beyonce and Rihanna and Jay-Z are what we look to in terms of financial wealth and well-being for black folks. I know it's a wonderful question. We, we were talking about uh, my dear sister Beyonce before and the way in which Especially with Coachella, you see this shift that's taking place. The Nina Simone's legacy is beginning really to penetrate in a serious way. It's connected to tradition. But you see, in a market-driven culture, though, it's not just about individuals. It's really about how your spirit and character is being shaped. You see, if you really believe that you're going to feel so much better about yourself because you've got a huge mansion, you're living large, and you've got a trophy spouse and so forth, then you need spiritual transformation because it just won't last that long I mean everybody fall into it at certain moments because it's a human thing but you got to really ask the question what is the source of your enduring joy not your ephemeral pleasure mm. you see that's a spiritual question you see and all of us fall short you try again fight fail again fail better but it's a spiritual question. And so part of the problem of our young people is that their spiritual life has been so truncated mm -hmm. by the market culture. Mm -hmm. And the families are weak. I grew up in the ghetto. It was a community. Donnie Hathaway sang about the love in it. Many of them grew up in the hood. That's not a sight of a lot of overwhelming love. That's survival of the slickest, just like Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So that so many of our young people are not loved enough. They're not cared for enough. I didn't have to worry about that. You see. So whoever I am, I am who I am because my mama loved me, my daddy loved me, my grandmama loved me, Reverend Cook loved me, Deacon Hinton loved me, Sarah Ray, my vacation Bible school teacher loved me. I wasn't worthy of it, but I received it. <laughs> see? And I'll be true to it until the day I die. Large numbers of young folk of all colors don't receive that. So they're looking for something. And so when you tell them, what do, shall a person profit who gain the whole world hmm. but lose their soul? lose their soul in terms of who they are, how you relate to people, what your reward structure really looks like? Is it only measurable in materialistic terms? Or is it measurable in moral and spiritual and political terms? These are the perennial questions of every generation. We have seen a younger generation who is the most bombarded by a spiritually vacuous, market-driven culture obsessed with things, 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 money, 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 power, power, power. Yeah. That's why I salute so many of them, because if I had grown up mm. in circumstances that they grew up, oh, Lord. I mean, one, I would have been in jail a long time ago. <laughs> and I still may end up in jail. <laughs> it's true. There's nothing but the Holy Ghost holding me together. I may break loose tonight and do something so ungodly. <laughs> 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 you just don't know. I'm, I'm being honest about this. <laughs> you see what I mean? It, this, this is a momentary thing. It's day to day. 
<laughs> but for our precious young people of all colors, even the well-to-do, I see them at Harvard and Princeton all the time. 800 board scores, straight A's, and wondering whether they're still loved or not. <laughs> Does mom and dad really affirm me anyway, even though I got all this money? Why? Because money is never the measure of it. i tell you a story about one of the great geniuses of all time. His name is Stephen Sondheim. He's one of my favorites. He's still alive, God bless him. You all know Stephen Sondheim. West Side Store in his 20s with Leonard Bernstein. Company, 1970, Sunday in the, Sunday, Sunday in the Park with George. That's it. Absolutely. And then passion. and Oh, magnificent. I'll never forget I was interviewing him one time. And, and I said, but brother, I, I've just noticed this pain, this ache. He's a gay brother, too. God bless him. And he said, I said, what is it about this blues element that shot through with you? He said, oh, I got a story for you. I was an only child. My mother was a piano player uh, in, in, on Broadway. And she was going to the hospital and was told that there's a 30% chance of her to live, given this triple, bipar the, the, the triple uh, bypass of her heart. And she was given a pen and paper. They said, if you need to write anything as a legacy, you might need to write it. And she wrote one line. She said, to Stephen. I have no regrets in life other than giving birth to you. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And I reached over and I gave a hug to my dear brother Sondheim and I said, I've been a black man in America for decades and I ain't never experienced mm. that level mm. of alienation because my mama loved me. Mm. My daddy loved me. Mm. I said, so even though you grow up on the vanilla side of town, Jewish brother, genius to the core, gay brother, he's wrestling with forms of catastrophe I know not of. Mm. Just like I'm wrestling with forms of catastrophe in relation to white supremacy, he knows not of. Yeah, right. But his genius soul person that he is, digging deep inside of his own soul. So when you listen to No More and uh, what's what's the uh, the play where, where it, into the woods? That's right. But part one is happy. You live happy ever after. And part two is Cinderella gets to Prince and discovers, is that all you are? <laughs> <laughs> all this wishing I've been doing. And Sondheim says, what? Wishes come may come true, but never free. Mm. See, that's coming out of his genius and his experience. That's our human connection. All of our human connections, because catastrophe is on its way to all of our houses in one form or another. Mm. And our young people have to be fortified and equipped. That's why I continually talk about being fortified. That sixth chapter of Ephesians. You got to put on the whole armor, mm -hmm. yeah. put it on. And yeah. even when you put it on, you better make sure you're with the right army. Mm -hmm. And it has to be an army who's not sunshine soldiers, but all season warriors. And even if they're all season warriors, you still might get crushed. Mm -hmm. So what? Go down swinging right. with a smile, with style. Don't ever allow anybody to steal your joy mm -hmm. that you get out of serving others fighting for others, highlighting others. Because mm. once you have that joy, it's irreducible. Hmm. And once they know they can't smash and suffocate that joy, then you, ooh, this is a wonderful. You remember that song by Ashley Simpson called Send It? Send it. Sing a little bit. Oh, is Sarah here? <laughs> Sarah, Send I think it. it's ba -ba 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 -ba. You well, got to just pass on the joy. Sarah, do you know pass that? Pass on the joy. <laughs> Send it. That's Astrid and Simpson. Like a puff of smoke. Mm. You see, just send it. Keep dishing it out. Allow it to flow. Back to the language of Edward F. Adams, 1903, the founding of this institution. He said, we're going to provide a, an attempt to seek the truth in what? Turn it loose into the world. James Brown said, give it up. <laughs> Turn it loose. 
Send the love, send the joy, send the service, send the connection, send the grins, send the laughter, send the joy, the, the sorrow and the sadness too. Send that on. That's who we are. We are the recipients of that sending. Hmm. And the worst thing in America we've ever come up with is this notion of being self-made. Well. Because if you gave birth to yourselves, please stand up and let everybody <laughs> see. Let everybody see <laughs> the level of your self-deception. <laughs> Nobody makes it on their own. They depended on something bigger than them, depended on those who came before. You work hard, you sacrifice, you're brilliant. If you're like Sondheim or like Coltrane or, or Ella, Ella Baker, Ella Fitzgerald, you're a genius. That's a small slice. Doesn't make them better. They just are who they are, like Toni Morrison. Mm. She's just a genius, and most of us are not. Yeah. That's all right. But no Toni Morrison with her mama, her daddy, her church, Howard University. We can go on and on and on. I know that was a long answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> long answer to that question. I know, and I'm, I'm getting the nod. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. There is so much more that I definitely wanted to say and ask, and I mean, from the 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 Ted Cruz quoting uh, Frederick Douglass, I thought about you because it made me, so for folks who have not read Black Prophetic Fire, I would recommend reading it because in it you talk about people who live longer than their fire. And when people are quoted, sometimes the context that they quote is after the fire has burned out. And so I thought immediately of you of that when in that point. And then I would just say as we end and you think about joy, the idea of hope comes to me. And this, again, from King, who you refer to often. They had no alternative except to accept the fact of slavery, but they clung tenaciously to the hope of freedom. In a seemingly hopeless situation, they fashioned within their souls a creative optimism that strengthened them. And so with that, I say thank you for strengthening us and providing us with optimism. So. So, I have to, I have to say this part here. Our thanks to Dr. Cornell West, professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University, professor emeritus at Princeton University, and author of the book, Race Matters. We also thank our audience here and on radio, television, and the internet. The San Francisco Human Rights Commission has been pleased to provide assistance with this program. I'm Cheryl Davis, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. God bless you.